Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Regis College President's Lecture Series on Health. I'm Tony Hayes, President of Regis College, and I'm pleased to welcome all of you, nurses, social workers, faculty from a variety of areas in the healthcare world, undergraduate, graduate students from our health professions and, the pub and public health, as well as the public who have registered for tonight's event. We are incredibly fortunate to have three amazingly prestigious speakers who are knowledgeable on tonight's subject matter and incredibly committed to their work. Tonight, we're going to address long-term care. As a geriatric nurse practitioner since 1978 and working in long-term care and community care, my clinical career has always been tied to the care of older adults. It's crucial that healthcare providers understand the complex care needs of the older adult. As this population over the age of 65 has increased exponentially. The pandemic not only reminded us of the ongoing prevalence of racism in our society, but it also brought attention to the ongoing prevalence of ageism in our society. And this needs to change. I am so grateful this, for this important discussion tonight. And I'm so grateful to have the opportunity to meet these amazing panelists. But before I introduce the panelists, boring Penny. I know, I know. I have to introduce some of our, I would call those um, housekeeping. To receive contact hours or class credit for attending this evening, you must stay until the end, which includes the question and answer period. For CEUs or class credit, you must click on the link to the evaluation survey that will be posted in the chat at the end of the Q&A. You must include your name. Students, you must include your name as well as your faculty's name. And you must in complete the evaluation form and submit it. CEU certificates will be emailed to RNs in seven to 10 business days. Students do not receive evidence of having attended, but your faculty will be sent a list of their students who attended. So again, make sure that you put your name and your faculty's name in. If you are not requesting contact hours or class credit, please still fill out the evaluation form because we really do appreciate your feedback and will help us with future topics. The evaluation link is posted in the chat at the end of the program and will remain there until 8.45. So make sure you copy it. The evaluation will remain open, however, until 10 p.m. A few quick meeting reminders. You may have noticed that all attendees have been muted. We ask that you remain muted throughout the lecture with your view video turned off. At any time during the program, you may submit questions into the chat. We will be doing things differently, however, because there might be some interaction between the speakers during the presentation, and we will allow time for questions after the first speaker. During the final Q&A session, we will ask you to post your questions directly in the chat or to Tyler. During the last 10 minutes of the Q&A, you may also ask questions in person by raising your virtual hand. And if you are called on, don't forget to unmute yourself, something I always forget to do. Now, before I use too much more of this time, I'd like to introduce you to our amazing panelists. Our first speaker is Jake Quigley, MSDLP, who is currently the Vice President of Operations for Benchmark Senior Living. Benchmark is a premier senior living provider in seven states throughout the Northeast, offering independent living, 
assisted living and memory care across 65 communities. You go, Jake. <laughs> we are fortunate to also have him as an adjunct professor here at Regis College, where he teaches courses in gerontology, healthcare management, and public policy. That's even a go, you go, Jake. Dr. Quigley brings more than 19 years of experience to his talk this evening. Prior to Benchmark, he served as the Director of Asset Management for the RMR Group, an owner of over 250 senior living communities across 37 states. He also served 10 years as an Executive Director for numerous senior living communities throughout the Northeast. He is a five-year veteran of the U.S. Navy, where he served in healthcare operations in Spain, Rhode Island, and Cuba. He started his career in long-term care at Meadowlark Hills Retirement Community in Manhattan, Kansas. It was in Kansas where he learned, earned three degrees from K-State, a bachelor's degree in gerontology, long-term care administration, and a master's degree in gerontology, as well as a master's degree in community development. He realized Boston was the place to be, so he came here to earn a doctorate in law and public policy from Northeastern, and he never left. Tonight, Dr. Quickly will be clarifying concepts in long-term care, so we are all on the same page. And then later in the panel, he will discuss the financial ch challenges that we face in providing long-term care. Our second speaker is Laurie Roberto, MBA. Laurie is an administrator of a skilled nursing and rehabilitation center at the Commons in Lincoln, located in Lincoln, Massachusetts. The Commons in Lincoln is a continuing care retirement community, which offers independent living, assisted living, memory care, and skilled nursing care. A licensed nursing home administrator, Laurie's entire career spanning more than 30 years, mine has been 50, Laura, has focused on skilled nursing and senior living communities. She has a bachelor's degree in health administration and is, has a master's degree in business administration. Laurie's heart and soul has been dedicated to serving the senior population and their families. She strives to make sure residents make safe, and personalized decisions for transitions of care. She states, and I quote, her favorite part of the job is impacting residents and their families and the associates. That's what keeps me grounded and engaged. Laurie will be speaking about the role of long-term care services in the United States. Kelly Lapierre, DNP, GNP, C, a geriatric nurse practitioner who served as director of the Adult Gerontology Primary Care Nurse Practitioner Program at Regis for more than 14 years, prior to returning to Boston College, where she earned her bachelor's in nursing in 1985 and is now an assistant prof clinical professor at Boston College. Dr. LaPierre brings years of experience to her presentation tonight. Her career began in the Veterans Affairs Hospital in Brockton and West Roxbury, where several of her patients had served as far back as World War I. Since 2012, she has been a nurse practitioner at Wellesley Primary Care in Wellesley, Mass., where she maintains a five-star rating and still practices one day a week. While at Wellesley Primary Care, she introduced an old concept in medicine, the house call, to ensure that frail elderly members of the community could receive the attention and treatment they needed. Dr. Lapierre has traveled considerably farther than Wellesley Weston and the Metro West in the interest of promoting health. While at Regis College, she co-led the Regis in Haiti project launched in 2007 to provide a graduate program for nursing instructors in that country, the poorest in the Western Hemisphere. 
They graduated 37 participants who earned master's degrees in nursing and leadership over the course of a decade. She states, and I quote, their teaching abilities just blossomed. They've become better teachers and now they're producing better nurses in their country. She brings her passion for education and care of the elderly to her presentation tonight. Quote, from the nurse's perspective, person-centered care, how is it done? And I will now introduce Jake. And I will make sure I can get this program up. Should be here, okay. So this this is what uh, President Hayes was saying. Let's begin, Jake Quigley, you are on. All righty. Good evening, everyone. Um, we can jump to the next slide, Penny. Whoops, now I, I, that happens all the time. There we are. I think as a group of panelists and I were meeting around this, we really found that we all had very different terminology when it came to a lot of the terms we describe the aging service industry. So I thought we'd spend a little time just kind of reviewing what that what that actually means. Um, so I think long-term care historically has always been kind of an overarching word or kind of descriptor of um, a broad range of services that really impact and care for seniors. So we might use that interchange interchangeably. Um, certainly long-term care certainly focuses on long-term care, sorry, around, around like skilled nursing, um, re rehab and such, but we're kind of going to use that term broadly around everything that pretty much affects and drives services towards the aging pop population. Aging services also is a term that came up a lot. Um, that's really around any services that are directly specifically um, impacting the aging adults. Um, I get a lot of questions around is primary care considered an aging service? Certainly it it can, can be. Um, but we're also going to focus a little bit more on the more specific um, types of practices and services that really just target that aging adult. Um, often the question comes up, what do we consider as an aging adult? Curious, I know most of you are on mute, but um, I think we tend to find this by a number. Um, however, I was in a community today in Connecticut and I had a 105 year old person. Um, someone said, can you tell us how old you are? And the resident responded, I'm not old, I'm 105 years young, right? So I think when President Hayes was also talking around ageism, and certainly we experienced that more during the pandemic as well, but certainly classifying someone as aging um, can be a sensitive sub sub subject. We also tend to, I think in our society, since a lot of aging benefits start around 65, like Medicare, and that's when most folks retire, we tend to quantify that with a number. Um, but we're gonna be talking about everyone um, who might consider themselves aging. And for, just for reference sake, we'll probably use that number 55 and above, and I'll explain more why. Um, the next piece is where can aging services be done? Um, we're gonna talk a lot about that tonight as well. We certainly have congregate options, institutional options for seniors to age and services to be provided. Also uh, more professional services like a doctor's office, hospice agency, et cetera. But as we're finding, a lot of folks are choosing to age in their actual homes and in um, designated communities, such as the community that Lori rep represents, the Commons in Lincoln. And then we also talk about what a what does it mean to be a provider? And uh, most of you are in the clinical space. So sometimes we think about the provider as the actual person providing care. Um, that term often gets um, shared and utilized as around a provider as someone who is providing aging services. So in this um, example, um, Dr. LaPierre would be a provider as she's providing primary care and health services to patients. Lori also would be a provider as she's leading a skilled nursing organization that's providing care. So we will use the provider in the larger sense. But please ask a question or, um, you know, in the chat box, if you have a question when we start talking about these different terms, but certainly want to clarify it if we need to. Great. 
and you will go to the next one. Often they get asked the question, why? Um, some folks might have heard it's the silver tsunamis coming. And it's really, as I'm sure most of you all know, working in the health healthcare space, but for those who are joining who may not, um, the fastest growing population is the aging aging adult. Um, and that in that research term wise is for the 65 years of age and older. Um, by the we're expected to increase the overall po population of the aging adult between 80 and 90 million by 2050. That really means that um, one in five Americans will be over the age of 65 in the next six years. Obviously, that's driven by our baby boom generation, kind of the post World War II, um, you know, rise and increase significantly in births. Those folks are now aging with us and becoming part of that aging co cohort now. Next slide, Ms. Penny. Um, some of the other terms I think that we um, often talk about as well. Long-term care can also mean the nursing home, skilled nursing, rest homes, rehab. Those are all describing that skilled nursing environment, and that's certainly the area that Lori is going to speak with us this evening on as well. Assisted living. Assisted living hasn't been around as long as nursing homes. Um, assisted living is kind of a newer concept. It probably started in the early 90s. Prior um, long term care skilled nursing nursing homes were the primary provider type that was providing for aging adults and most of you I grew up in rural Kansas, the nursing homes in my area growing up were typically county ran um, and even um, nonprofits started by churches. Um, certainly, we're going to talk about how that's morphed as well. Assisted living really came into the forefront in the 90s. In Massachusetts, the first set of regulations for assisted living started in 1991. Memory care is another term I think that's being used more. Now we have a lot of marketing terms and such to describe the services we're using. Memory care often refers to assisted living. Um, it's a form of assisted living where it's a dedicated, secured community environment for those with cognitive impairment. It can also certainly um, be a memory care neighborhood or unit on a skilled nursing um, community as well. And then the next one here, we have continuum care communities, or they often get referred to as CCRCs or a life plan community. Again, another rep representation that Lori um, currently works at, <clears throat> these are typically where folks pay a large entrance fee um, they might move in in their 70s, 80s, typically, and then they're paying in a large fee living with the community for a period of time. And when they say continuum of care, it's because they often will offer independent assisted memory care and then skilled nursing all within one campus. So when you move there, you may move through the continuum, but you may not have to move out. Um, the other term that gets used a lot is a life plan community. And that entrance fee that you're buying into is pretty much a contract that the provider is going to care for you from the point you enter to the community all the way to your end of end of life care. This is a new one pop, popping up. Our next one is what we call an active adult. Um, if anyone's a fan of the Jimmy Buffett Margaritavilles when you're on vacation, Jimmy Buffett has leaned in heavy to this and is creating the 55 active adult communities now. Um, probably one of the most widely known active adult community is the Villages, just north of Orlando in Florida. And that's a very large, um, little over 1,400 different apartments and homes on a large campus. The active adult is really targeting that 55 plus. And again, I'm using numbers for ages to kind of classify this. And why they do have that number is it does allow from a fair housing standpoint for these communities to essentially discriminate based on based on age. So a 55 plus community has a specific designation where they only are permitting folks to live in the community who are 55 years and older. Most of our assisted living communities um, require an age around 62. Um, our skilled nursing does not have an age restriction um, in that sense as well. And then hospice and palliative care, these are certainly terms that I think are coming up more often now. Um, certainly hospice has been around for many, many years, 
and palliative care, I think, is um, becoming much more common in our healthcare system, which Dr. Lapierre will speak about tonight as well. And then home. Home is still an aging choice for many, many folks during the aging pro process. Only less than about 10% of our population choose to live in congregate and institutional living situations. The majority of folks, that 90% and above is represented, they would choose to live at home. Um, as, as we know, we probably all have been impacted personally or professionally that some folks wish to live at home, but circumstances may not per permit that, and they may have to live into one of our congregate housing options. All right, Ms. Sure. Penn. Is that your last slide, I think? I believe. Yes, it is. And I do want to go back a second because I do have a question. Yes, and that is, um, could you, I have two questions, actually. What is the, the actual difference then between a continuing, continuum retirement committee uh, community or a life plan community? Or are they the same? They're very similar. It's just usually that con contract. Uh, if anyone's familiar with Ericsson Senior Living, it's almost like you're buying insurance through through them, but you're pretty much essentially that insurance fee, your contract is providing care for your entire life. They just vary depending on the type of community. One part of notice here too is independent living is another option for folks. Um, there are two, they pretty much differ from that payer type. Um, most of these other assisted living memory care options are, we're going to talk a little bit about later. Um, they're kind of defined by the payer type, they're private pay to, typically, um, and they're a rental option versus the continuum care communities require an entrance fee. Okay, and then my other question was, um, and this comes from being a researcher and trying to uh, trying to engage students in nursing research. Has the lack of, I have to read this, has the lack of definitive terms impacted research in the area of gerontology? For example, what services or plans have the best outcomes and for which patients? I mean, how can you really, if you really don't have concepts well-defined, that makes it pretty tough. So it's going to make it hard to convince people of, you know, the value of some of these things, um, given that. So just want to know if that's true or not. I would say it is true. I think there's a lot of research that centers around healthcare outcomes for skilled nursing, probably because we have much more available data because it's a CMS, Medicare, Medicaid funded option, more regulated. We're reporting out more data on our healthcare out, out, outcomes where assisted living and memory care, um, independent living doesn't have that kind of data collection apparatus to really be able to report what that looks like. Certainly there's a lot of research that's coming up around like social isolation and how community living can be a benefit. But Penny, it's a great point. Um, active adult has really only come into mainstream conversations the last 10 years or so. So we really don't have probably a full grasp of what that impact from a healthcare outcome is, is yet. And for those providers out there in the audience, that's as soon as we have to start collecting the data that would be important uh, in continuing research, uh, that's when we get bogged down in all the paperwork. So it's really, it's a, you know, between a rock and a hard place, but it is important. So, so we'll turn it over now to Lori Roberto. Lori, are you on? I'm on, right? Yes, it's very important to mute me. Oh. <laughs> especially when other people are presenting to zip it. So Yes, it is. You're right. Yes. So it's it's my pleasure to be here. I, I appreciate the fact that I've been invited to do this presentation. Um as um folks have said, you know, my, my this is near and dear to my heart. And I've worked my whole entire career um, pretty much in long term care. Um, this this picture uh, that that's presented in front of us really depicts kind of what's going on in our industry. And when I think about skilled nursing professionals um, that 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 work in in my direct field, I think about the strength. I think about the deep roots of that of this tree and just how difficult it has been 
over the years to navigate through all the changes and of all the services that are being presented nowadays um, to our seniors, really skilled nursing is is one of the oldest, um, along with certainly acute care environments. So there's a lot. There's a lot to learn from the expertise of of the team that that works on this. So I just I do love where this this picture is taking us um, as we navigate through and and try to develop some creativity along the way and, and adjust um, because that's all we've done over the years is truly adjust to the changes in the landscape. So I'm going to walk you through it. Penny, if you can give me the next slide. So I'm going to quickly just show you some pictures. And, and again, it isn't only about the commons. I am going to reference a continuing care retirement community, um, which I have the pleasure of being able to participate um, running the skilled nursing, the rehabilitation and skilled nursing. But we do have independent living, assisted living in memory. And it's the it, it really depicts the the perfect setting for folks to be able to receive services, maintain their level of independence um, and be able to have the safety net of a continuum of care with assisted living memory and in the rehab when they need it intermittently um, and then to certainly rehab and go back to the prior level of um, living which would be independent living or assisted so i'm just kind of fl quickly flip through some of those pictures so that folks can get a sense of one of the continuing continuing care retirement communities in massachusetts which is the commons so I'm going to let you keep working through those, Penny. This is independent living. Alive and well. And this is our assisted living, some of our apartments and some of the programming, the artwork and so forth that gets done by residents. And certainly the fabulous um, nutritional services department which the food is amazing which is very important to cry you know all the way through to the skilled nursing so i'll let you continue um memory and then the next one and then this is the the rehab and you know offering the services that we provide um, to not only the folks that live on the campus which is 20% of our folks come directly from the campus and 80% come from the community at large. So we're able to, to share wonderful services to folks outside of, of the commons as well. So this is just a model and we'll we'll go back to it as we as we continue to go through the slides. Okay, I think that's where I want to start. Thank you, Penny. So the role of long-term care services and some of the trends and the catalysts that impact senior services um, nationally, but certainly on a local level. Um, as we all know, our population is aging and with techn technical advances, um, we're able to keep people alive longer and living healthy lives. Um, it's important for us to adapt even to that because as a there's a whole host of folks. The demographics are shifting, um, the baby boomers and their expectations, um, evolving consumer landscape. We need to be able to adapt to that. They're expecting a lot more from us. They're expecting services that emphasize independence, autonomy, leisure, person-centered, family, and, and living with dignity. Um, it's not going to necessarily happen in the historical models of care. If you go back, you know, I'm going to take myself back to the mid 80s, um, early 90s. And, you know, nursing homes in the past, I mean, we did a great job, you know, with what we had. Um, we took care of folks, we housed them, we fed them three meals, and we provided, you know, some activities. We did music and bingo and all those kinds of things. A lot of the folks that were living in our nursing homes, they made their own beds. You know, I mean, typically, you know, folks that can make their own beds probably don't need to be there. Certainly nowadays, they don't need to be there. 
So we looked, you know, we, we certainly started to see the change. And, you know, I had the pleasure of working up on the North Shore. Uh, my skilled nursing facility sat on Beverly Hospital's campus. And I have fond memories of the president of Beverly Hospital probing me and asking me at, at meetings that we would be attending, Laurie, tell me, what percentage of your folks in the skilled nursing facility could live in assisted living? And of course, there was no such thing as assisted living at the time, but he was asking those probing questions. And of course, you know, and he asked me about my private census of what percentage, and I would respond with, well, maybe 10%, because of course, I'm trying to protect my turf. And lo and behold, within probably five years, um, in 1996, we constructed the Herrick House, which was the very first um, model um, assisted living that was a medical model. And it was the very first facility in Massachusetts. So I quickly had to adapt and I was forced to adapt, you know, because I was certainly transferring people over. Folks weren't going to be coming my way anymore. So we quickly have to change and we have to continue to do that. Um, so I was, again, happy to be part of that. Um, I learned a, a lot from, from being on the campus. And within a five year period of time, we went from a sleepy, predominantly private pay, probably 60% private pay, um, 15 admissions a month. Within five years, we were doing 100 admissions a month. So we adjusted quickly and became really the facility of choice for short-term rehab. Um, that you know, certainly changed our complete structure internally and how we had to you know, provide that, that level of service and that care. Um, so that's that's where the history is, and now where are we? You know, current models of care, just as Jake had referenced, you know, assisted living. So here, the first one, for the first medical model up in Beverly, Massachusetts, and then it exploded, you know, nationwide and certainly throughout Massachusetts and alive and well, and still they're adjusting, they're adapting, and they're certainly taking folks that they probably in their wildest dreams wouldn't have taken, you know, way back 10 years, 15 years ago. And um, they're doing, they're taking folks with mechanical lifts. They've adjusted, you know, and, and, and continue, continue to do that. But it's, in, but it's offering an environment that is different than what we could really have provided. First of all, in some of the very old dwellings that are in Massachusetts that are perhaps not as aesthetic, aesthetically pleasing. Um, but they also have these new great assisted livings that have, you know, common areas for people to be able to connect um, with other residents and so forth, forming new relationships and really living their lives in a quality setting and at a lower cost. So again, we, we adjust. Future models of care. You know, we talked a little bit about the CCRCs. Um, I'm not going to continue to go too much into that, um, with the with the exception of just saying that, you know, we truly do need to adjust and partner with whether you are a single um, skilled nursing facility or if you're connected, partner with some of these communities um, because you 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 still need to in a skilled nursing facility there are still always going to be folks that need that level of care. However. Um, folks are going to live longer, they're going to age in place, and they're going to do it with dignity. And they're going to do it with safety nets. When you work through a continuing care retirement community, you usually have a medical um, group. And at the Commons, for example, we have a medical director and a nurse practitioner. And the continuity across the campus, folks are seen by both of those individuals, which is great. So when they're with me, they get discharged across the continuum. When they come to me, they've already been seen oftentimes by those providers. The other thing that I want to talk a little bit about is the greenhouse model. It's been around for a while, but I don't think it's used necessarily a lot. Um, there, I, I had the pleasure of also participating in a project at Fox Hill Village in Westwood when I was there running the skilled nursing facility. Again, it was a continuing of care. And they constructed 
three houses to take care of memory impaired folks. And the greenhouse model is really based on the premise that it's a family. You know, you we want to be able to provide models of care that are based on or simulate living at home, whether you live at home or you're going to live in a more structured community, you want to be able to simulate um, that feeling of being at home. So when I show up to work in a, a setting such as the green, such as a greenhouse model, I might be a CNA, I might be a nurse, I might be a housekeeper. However, I'm going to work outside my roles. I'm going to eat with the residents. I'm going to do the dishes with the residents. I'm going to do the laundry with the residents. I'm going to live with them during my eight hour shift. And I don't think that we've utilized that model as much as I don't hear enough about it anymore, um, but it's a good model. And I'd like to see more of it, just like I'd like to see it. And we will see more of an explosion on the CCRCs as well. The thing about the transition of, uh, of risk, that's my own little term that I'm using. I do think as providers across the continuum of care, we want to, and that's whether it's be, be with the PCPs, whether it be with home care, whether it be in the hospital setting, skilled nursing setting, assisted living, um, <clears throat> independent living, we want to be able to look at the transition risks. As we transition models of care, let's be, let's be mindful that the expertise is offered in the, in the appropriate setting. Sometimes that's out of sync. Sometimes we, we work beyond our scope, maybe in an assisted living. If we're going to start to take certain patients and residents into those settings, we want to make sure that those services are there to deliver them in a safe manner. And again, when you look at a CCRC, the expertise that you have available under the roof will allow for that. Um, so I, I, I just put that out there because, you know, are we looking for more regulations in assisted living? Probably not. And we're looking for regulations, independent living, probably not, because that's not what the model is. The model is home-like environment, not a regulatory body coming in. So I'm going to segue into my next slide. The regulatory environment and framework. Skilled nursing facilities are highly regulated. And certainly even more so post-pandemic landscape in impacting the service delivery. We truly, even though COVID was everywhere, it was in your neighbor's house, it was in your own house, it was in the hospitals, it was in assisted living, independent living, it was in the school systems, it was everywhere. But certainly at skilled nursing facilities, we were, um, broadcasted in the media, much more so than any other setting, unfortunately. And <clears throat> that doesn't mean it didn't exist everywhere, and that doesn't, doesn't mean that people didn't die everywhere. However, because we're so highly regulated, we actually were subject to continuous surveys, infection control surveys. Now, one could say we're too overly regulated, well, one could say, okay, we're going to embrace this. And we, even though I feel that we were experts in infection control procedures, even more so after this. Um, and we, we've been able to share our knowledge with, with um, certainly other, other aspects of, of care delivery systems, um, even in the hospital. You know, I think that there were times that, that we probably got better schooled in that. So I just wanted to share that. Um, but it did impact our industry. You know, some of the other regulatory expectations are uh, mandatory staffing requirements. We all know about the five-star rating. It looks at our um, survey results, uh, quality measures, which are clinical quality measures, rehospitalizations, and staffing. Um, overall impact that this has all had on our nursing facilities. Um, you know, we think about Think about how um, <clears throat> how this has impacted us, and you go back to the analogy of the tree. 
and the strength that, that we have in our industry. Um, it's important work that we do and it's responsible work and we need to we need to do it in a safe manner. So regulations are regulations. It helps us. It creates that that structure for us, um, that skeletal system, so to speak. The changing roles in long term care will be the next slide. Before we go to that slide, can I just ask a quick question? You have a question. <laughs> yeah. Even if okay. even if uh, with all the new regulatory issue, issues, um, does that impact the cost of the services? Oh, very much so. Yeah, that's what I was. Time afraid. is money. Yeah, time is money. Okay, and just checking. Time is money. And, you know, when we have, for example, we have, you know, one resident who has COVID. It's an operational nightmare. Uh, on what we have to do to make sure that that one resident, COVID or flu or um, RSV, I mean, we, 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 turn on a dime in our system we we're now so um it's so automatic with us now so it doesn't it, it it's not like this major hurdle that we have to get through but it's it it is an operational nightmare to like okay everyone goes back in masks and what we have to do to keep people is protocols that that we follow um to keep people safe so it's it, it's it's there's a cost associated with it and certainly just you know even in the PPE um, education and training was a cost associated with it. Yeah. I hope that answered the question. Yes, it did. Okay. Okay, so changing roles. So we can't do all of this without our workforce. You know, we can't do it without our human resources and how valuable and important they are to us. They're everything. You know, beyond our patients and our families, our human resources and developing our folks is ex is extremely important. And with the changes that we've been through over the years, and we talk about the volume of admissions, we talk about the acuity. How do we bring our associates along to be able to meet those needs? There's a tremendous amount of developing um, that goes into it and um, developing our RNs, LPNs, CNAs. However, we also need to develop all of our associates. The dishwasher is a caregiver, a true caregiver. The dishwasher, the dietary folks, the cooks, you know, certainly, um, you know, the rest of the department heads, rehab. We need to develop folks so that they understand and that they have some clinical acumen so that we provide the services, even from a nutritional standpoint, right diet, right time, right texture. Um, we can, we, I used to say to my associates, we, we can actually kill someone on the tray line if, if we don't have their diet correct. Our processes need to be impeccable so that we, so that we do a good job um, taking care of them in a safe environment. Developing new roles and responsibilities. Um, so to that extent, you know, we talked about the nurse practitioner and the role of the nurse practitioner in our setting. They're part of the medical team. You know, they work with the physician. You know, you don't always have access to efficient physician. Um, and we need to, to make sure that, that we have that certainly at the commons as well across the continuum. A full complement of physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, which is always difficult to recruit for as well, um, but also um, RT, respiratory therapy. And the role of the diet technician. So as we try to grow and figure out, how, again, I, I focus on the food because it's so important. Um, we have diet technicians, which, you know, one of the requirements is to make sure that the nurse is available to make sure that the diet, the food that the residents are receiving is accurate um, per the diet. Well, the diet technicians, instead of taking a nurse practitioner, I mean, excuse me, taking a nurse off the floor, it's a diet technician that that's schooled in being able to do that. Um, so we've adapted and, and adjusted. Develop, how are we going to the next slide, if you could, if you would, Penny, thank you. Developing a qualified work um, force into the future. How are we going to do that? 
So we're trying to recruit. How do you recruit? There's not enough folks out there. The cost of attracting qualified associates is through the roof. You know, we, especially after the pandemic, through the roof, trying to bring in folks. And we need to look at creative ways of hiring talent. You know, sometimes you you, you need to hire the person. Um, you need to hire that smile. You need to to bring them them in and figure out how to train them and bring them along. We have to be more creative. Um, <clears throat> in retention, when you have them and you've got good solid associates, you keep them, you hang on to them, you figure out what it will be to challenge them and inspire them and look at real true career ladder development. You know, certainly you need to have a good culture. You need to have a, a trustworthy environment, all of those kinds of things. But you also have to, people want to grow. They don't typically want to stay in the same role for the rest of their life or an entry level position. They want to be able to earn more, um, especially folks that are coming from other countries. Oftentimes they're nurses, doctors, um, all sorts of different backgrounds and uh, they've been through school. They just, they just need to, they need to learn English. They, we need to be creative. So what are some of the ways, and I'm going to have you move to the next screen, workforce trends in establishing a sustainable pipeline. One of the things that I've really enjoyed throughout my career has been career ladder development, um, hanging on to the good folks working with um, workforce development um, partners out in the field, you know, bringing your incumbent, incumbent employees, um, entry level CNAs to LPNs to RNs and beyond. How do you do that? Well, there are all sorts of opportunities, grant funding opportunities to be able to access and partnering with um, colleges, certainly workforce investment boards. There's a lot that can be done. And it's really our only way. We have to, we're responsible. It is our job to grow our future clinical folks, regardless of whether it's RNs, LPNs, or therapist, or what have you. It is our responsibility. No one's going to do it for us. Next screen. And I am, I am getting close. How am I doing on time, Penny? She said she was going to shut me off, so. You're fine. Okay. You're absolutely fine. We're, we're really ahead of schedule. So you've got plenty of time. Okay, great. So long-term care payment systems, pretty nut and bolt. Um, Medicare insurance that covers the short stays. Private self-pay will cover extended stay, assisted living, and skilled nursing facilities. Um, Mass health, um, that's, that covers for extended stay in a skilled nursing and it limited assisted living um, and and memory programs. So therefore, there's a gap. Um, there's a gap in services for folks. Some people are in between. They are not eligible for mass health, and they can't afford assisted living, skilled nursing. Um, so there's sometimes a gap for folks that I think, as an industry, we we do need to be able to manage. There's also a gap in the cost um, of coverage for, for mass health. Mass Health pays $35 roughly, $35 a day less than what it costs us to take care of um, folks. And that is something that we have been grappling with the whole entire time I've been in this industry. And it's it's time. We have to figure out how to do it better, lower costs, and get it paid for by somebody, by somebody. So I challenge all of us as we start to move into the future on ways of being able to do that. Um, next slide. So fiscal, <clears throat> oops, one more. Okay, fiscal trends and shared risks. So as a skilled, as a skilled nursing provider, um, I, I do need to continue to try to find opportunities for us to be fiscally strong and survive 
in this ever-changing world that we're in. Um, the, the facility that I happen to run right now predominantly is short-term rehab. And it's a, it's a um, high volume, it's a small entity, um, but a high volume turnover. You know, we turn the whole place over, average length of stay is 17 days, and our partners are looking for less. Um, <clears throat> and we need to, to continue to be able to, you know, bring in up enough volume to sustain ourselves. And we need to look at partnerships and we look to payers, we look to partners, accountable care organizations. And what will they be looking for? Well, they're typically looking for a lower cost, they're looking for average length of stay to go down, and they're looking for good outcomes. So accountable care organizations, they, they typically involve a physician group, um, hospital group, and typically, oftentimes, they might be called a, a PHO, which is a physician hospital organization. These groups have been charged by the federal government to manage lives. And what I mean by managing lives is my life, by, I might be part of the group that they are managing. Maybe I haven't even gone to the hospital yet. Uh, maybe I have. Maybe I'm a frequent flyer. Um, but they're responsible for making sure that folks go through a continuum, get to the lowest level of care as quickly as possible, and are not rehospitalized. Um, they they look at the cost per care, they look at risk for rehospitalizations, and they're looking for providers, preferred provider relationships. And it's limited. They don't just let you in. You have to prove yourself. Um, you know, we just recently got in with uh, one of the uh, accountable care organizations, and it took us about three or four years of work to prove ourselves to get in. So it's not something that just happens. So preferred provider relationships also with insurance companies, insurance contracts, um, and then best practices. So what are they looking for? They're looking for high quality outcomes. So you have to have a team. You have to have your human resources that have the expertise to be able to assess patients well and have a good outcome. They're looking for a high customer experience. Like I said, they're looking for a shorter length of stay. And one would say, well, a short length of stay, well, you're going to kick them out too soon. Sometimes that can happen. Sometimes that can happen at the hospital level. Sometimes we have to manage up to prevent a rehospitalization. We have to manage relationships with the hospital to have that conversation when we look at something in a screen to make sure that we say, oh, geez, did you, my clinical team will question the hospital. Did you look at X, Y, Z? And it's a peer to peer review. Patient might not be ready to come and they thank us for doing that because we don't want them to bounce back because they haven't been fully worked up. They're looking at cost of care from the hospital. If I enter the hospital and I go home, home care, what's the cost of that service between all of that? What's the cost of the service between my case going from the hospital to a skilled nursing facility to home? Um, and minimizing, like I said, any rehospitalizations. So lots of communication. We now are held responsible on our five-star rating, even for folks that we discharge to home, if they bounce back to the hospital. Did we do the right handoff? Did we um, work with that home care agency to make sure that they were safe staying home? We are finally at the end. And my last slide is the summary. So I think embracing change is important. You know, we want to acknowledge that's a sticky finger there, Penny.
Okay. So we want to acknowledge and we want to welcome the change. The only way for us to be able to adapt to it is to, to bring it in, have it come in for dinner. This is what we need to do because we need to do a better job of taking care of our aging population. Um, <clears throat> movement to community-based services. We've got to adapt the workforce shrinkages. We have to adapt the intense regulatory expectations. We need to welcome it and we need to, we need to know it and we need to understand it and we need to learn it know it like the back of our hands. The accelerating cost of care with declining reimbursement. We have to figure it out. We have to do it at lower costs. Embracing the change. So new models of care and aligning with community-based services. Collaboration in innovation across settings is essential. So we need to build alliances with assisted living, with CCRCs, get comfortable with the discomfort of change and the need to adapt. We need to be nimble. Um, understanding and utilizing the regulations to boost performance, it's essential. The workforce pipeline and successful partnerships, we can do a better job. And us working on strategizing, doing these things, we have to realize it isn't necessarily going to fix the labor shortages tonight to fill a shift, to do what we need to do, but it will if we keep working at it help us a year from now, two years from now. And if we offer those opportunities, those career ladder development opportunities, our associates will talk to everybody about that and more people will come. Um, fiscal strategies, ACO and insurance partnerships. All of my presentation has really spoken to the need for partnership and how important it is. Um, that's that's really it. That's that that's it in a nutshell. And we have to we have to come up with innovative ideas. Talk to our partners in care. You know, we're not going to compete with different levels of services. We need to partner with them and and, and figure it out in a, an efficient manner. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Kelly, who really, where the rubber meets the road in the the um, person centered care, that is what it's all about. So. Kelly, I'm going to turn that over to you. Unmute. Okay, I'm back. Trying to figure out how to make all these things go away so I can see is always my challenge. So um, I have, um, I have to thank Dr. Glenn and President Hayes for inviting me to come and speak on this topic. They, I, they both know that this is something that is really kind of at the core of what I do as a geriatric nurse practitioner um, and being able to speak at the president's lecture series. I just feel like I've come home. So um, thank you. So let's, let's see if I can get my slides going. Um, I'm, I'm still here. I just, want to see if I can get rid of this bar, which I, all right, I know I could do that. All right, so um, as a geriatric nurse practitioner, there's nothing more at the core of what I do um, than figure out ways that I can promote quality of care with my patients or the individuals that I take care of. Um, and being able to work with the people like Jake and Lori, taking care of these individuals as they're getting older. So I, I pulled up some stats and bear with me, there's a reason for, for um, these stats. So when you think about it, and so thinking about, um, and I'm going to put a challenge out to all the NP students that are out there listening, 80 
8% of nurse practitioners are certified in some area of primary care. That's a really big number. 83.2% of this group are seeing Medicare patients. And we're going to talk about why is this important. And then 10.9% of us have privileges in long-term care. Why are these stats important? I look at these statistics and it, it really makes me excited because what this means is that there is a whole workforce of nurse practitioners out there that are going to be able to focus on how do we provide better care to individuals as we age and we we know that we're all aging and how do we do a better job and what i hope that you get from the end of my talk is that you feel empowered to be able to do this how do you engage your patients how do you promote quality of life and when you think about it it's done through person-centered care and as a geriatric nurse practitioner i've got I've got Jake put down so I can't see his face, but he's probably going to laugh when I say this. But Jake and I have worked together for a long time, and my introduction to assisted living was by Jake. And one of the things that I learned early on when I went into the nursing homes and the assisted livings that I had to really partner with the people that I took care of and whoever their support person was to be able to provide care that was consistent with their goals and their values. And the the doctor that I used to work with used to always say to me, don't come between Kelly and, and her patients and families. And I took that as a compliment because what our job is as a nurse and a nurse practitioner is to be able to advocate for our patients. And that is something that I am passionate about. And when I think about person-centered care, it used to be patient-centered care. And I'm really glad that that they make that CMS made the change to person-centered care because patient just has a sick connotation and not everybody that we're taking care of is sick, like Jake was saying. So what is it? It's care that's guided and informed by the individual's goals, preferences, and values. It's what they want. And it's not what we see as, as success. It's what they look at as success. Um, and, and that's really, I, I always use this as an example, but I had this patient that I went to him and I, I was trying to figure out, he was dying and I was trying to figure out how do I best support him? And I'm thinking everything medically, like what can I do? And so I said to him, I'm like, what would be a good day for you? And he said to me, if you could get me homemade chocolate chip cookies, like that's what he looked at as a good outcome for his day. And I was like a lunatic, like in the kitchen, like somebody's got to make me homemade chocolate chip cookies at all this man wants and you know what they did they did so it's not what we look at as success it's what our it's what the person that we're taking care of looks at as success person-centered care is integrated and coordinated care across the health systems the providers and the care settings and what that means in in as a nurse practitioner i look at us as being pivotal um to be the coordinator all, of all of these services because we work with other um, other healthcare providers that are taking care of the individuals that we're caring with. So we're co-treating. But when I think about providers and I was listening to what Lori was saying, how when I work in the nursing homes and the assisted livings and the memory care units, so that's pretty much where I base out of, it's not just the, the nurses and the administration that I work with. I work with the housekeepers. I work with the nurses' aides. I work with activities. Like they're all part of the team and we all see different things. And it's figuring out how do we all work together to do what the patient or the individual wants us to do for them. And so it's really important that that we, that we look at uh, our care team um, as a whole group of people in in the families in their in their roommates it could be really anybody it's how does everybody work together um for the betterment of the individual being consistent again with what their goals preferences and values are 
as nurse practitioners, we manage chronic and complex conditions. It's something that you guys are all being trained. I know because I know what you're getting for education right now. And I know that you're you're getting a lot of information on how do you manage complex chronic conditions. That's what we do. Um, joint decision making between the provider and the individuals. There, there is nothing more important than making decisions with your, with either the individual that you're taking care of or their surrogate decision maker if they're not able to make their own decisions. It's not our decision to make, and that's where engaging in these conversations early is is key. And and the whole relationship is built on trust and a commitment to long term well being, and when. When I think about this last, the relationship built on trust, I was listening when Laurie was talking about COVID and I was working in a, in a facility that was a secure memory care um, building and it had three units and the relationships that I was able to build with these individuals living there and their families really kind of carried us all through the COVID pandemic because we had already talked about prior to coming into this crisis situation, what were their goals and preferences and how did they want me to take care of themselves or their loved ones when we were in this crisis situation? And it was because we started the relationship and the conversations prior to the pandemic. And I really, I look at that as, as, a gift that I was given um, and being able to know what they wanted so that I could provide care that was consistent with what their values and beliefs were. So the focus of person-centered care is holistic care. And so basically we're, we're treating the whole person. We're not just treating their heart or their lungs or their feet. We're treating everything. We're individualizing the care. So how I approach one person is not going to be the same care that another person's going to get. We include the family and significant others. And, and I use family as a loose term because family is whatever we define as somebody that's important to us. Um, but we need to we need to be able to identify early on who do, does this individual identify as people that are important in their lives and that are supports for them. Um, collaboration is key. You, we can't do our job and we can't provide um, person-centered care if we're not all working together. The empowering piece is empowering and, and I actually just had this conversation with a guardian of a, of a patient that I saw for a palliative care consultation. And, and it was this woman and the 89-year-old sister-in-law were the co-guardians. And they, I, I was, I, I, they empowered me listening to how they were advocating. And, and I said to them, I said, I, I have to stop you for just one minute because I said, I'm so humbled at how you are advocating in such a loving and concerned and caring way for um, your sister-in-law. And they said, you know, what they said to me after is, you know, no one's ever said that to me. And I said, well, I, you need me, you need to hear me that you're doing a great job and don't ever question um, or apologize for asking questions because that's what your job is. And I say that to the patients too, or to the individuals I care for. When they ask me a question, they'll say, I'm really sorry, I don't wanna question your judgment. And, and my response always is, I want you to question my judgment. I want you to ask me questions because that's how we empower them. You're They're responsible for what their journey is and and i've just been invited on it with them so i need them to feel um that they're in charge as nurse practitioners and and you guys are learning this i know this is another thing that you guys are learning that we focus on prevention um, of diseases promotion of health and whatever that means for the person and individual choice. And the last thing is, is when we're planning and delivering care, we need to emphasize on developing the relationships before completing the tasks. And I think as nurses, and I say this all the time, and, and Dr. Glenn probably remembers me saying this, we were so hung up on our, our checklist. What are our checklists that we have to accomplish? And, and it's important, but 
even prior to the checklist, we need to have a relationship with our the individuals that we care for so that the checklist comes together and that they help us to develop what the checklist is going to be. So the American Association of College of uh, Colleges of Nursing, AACN, um, has a person-centered um, care model. And so they're um, in their their they are consistent with what the CMS or the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services um, says, and, and they support it. And so what they look at, and we just talked about this, is empowering recipients of care. Um, what we really are focusing on is making sure that we can improve somebody's quality of life, either improve it or maintain it, support their independence, promote positive well-being, Honor their choices. And one of the things when, when I teach my students, I always say to them, um, the American Geriatric Society came up with, and this was years ago, and it's just so wonderful if you have the chance to look at it. They're called doorway thoughts. And so they're they're culturally um a, they're culturally sensitive um documents that basically what the foundation says is that when you walk through the door. To, en to engage in any kind of encounter that you leave your thoughts at the door, your, your thoughts and your values stay at the door so that you can honor what the individual wants. And then we promote respect. And so the respect, if, if we don't agree with what somebody's wishes are, it's, it's not our decision to make. Our job is to respect them and to meet them where they're at and figure out how we move together forward. So I'm going to give you an example. So so how is person-centered care actually put into um, to effect? So Jane's an 80-year-old married female in good health. So for you, for the nurse practitioner students, I made this easy for you. So um, I didn't want to, I, I didn't want it to be complicated. So Jane's 80, she's married and she's in good health. Um, she's seeing her nurse practitioner for her yearly physical. And as an excellent nurse practitioner, you ask her if she has, um, if she has identified who she would like to have as her healthcare proxy, and if she has completed an advanced directive. Okay, why did this thing come back? Um, all right, so let's see where we go with this. Oh, somebody needs to be admitted and I need them off my screen. Okay, so what's the difference between advanced care planning and advanced directives? So this is a question that I get all the time. So, so having these conversations is a perfect example of person-centered care. So advanced care planning is the ongoing process of planning for future, future medical care. Um, and in this future medical care, when I talked with my patients, I even asked them about non-medical care and I integrate it right into this whole process. And so people always think when you start these conversations, it's about what they don't want. And so I always say to them, it's about what you want and what you don't want. And this is your voice. And it ref it's a reflection basically of um, how they want you to care for them. And it's documentation of their personal values and goals. And if it's not documented, then people don't know and they can't follow it. Advanced directives are legal documents um, that provide the actual instructions for what the future um, medical or personal care needs are. Examples of advanced directive documents that you may see, um, healthcare proxy is one that an individual identifies a proxy decision maker to make decisions, but this only goes into effect if they're not able to make the decision. So if they if they lack capacity, if they've had a stroke, if they've got advanced dementia, um, if something has happened that they're not able to make these decisions, then the healthcare proxy, we call it, gets triggered, and then they make the decisions. You don't need a lawyer um, to be able to develop to complete a healthcare proxy. 
Um, but I always ask my patients if they have a healthcare proxy. And then the other thing that I always do is whoever they're with, if it's a spouse, if it's a companion, if it's a family member, I always ask them if they have a healthcare proxy um, because it's just another opportunity that I can get the word out there and be able to teach the public. Durable power of attorney for healthcare um, is another um, term that they use for healthcare proxy. Um, durable power of attorney is something that you do need a lawyer for a durable power of attorney. So healthcare proxy and durable power of attorney for healthcare just deal with medical pro medical situations. The durable power of attorney, the best way to think about this is that they deal with stuff. So things that have some kind of a money value, that's what a durable power of attorney is and that's appointed. And a lawyer needs to complete that paperwork. A most, and we're gonna talk more about a most, and that's a medical order for life-sustaining treatment. And that's an order that's used within the state of Massachusetts um, to be able to um, say what someone's wishes are. And we use them a lot in the assisted livings and the SNFs. Um, people that have um, living at home that are declining, it's something that they can have at home. And then a living will is something that's completed by a lawyer. In the state of Massachusetts, a living will isn't a recognized legal document. And so what we do with the legal with a living will is I'll just say to somebody, you know, this is wonderful. You've already got the work done. Let's let's transfer what the wishes are onto a most form so that there's a form that's um, used within the state of Massachusetts. The challenge with all of these documents is that within our country, there's not one universal document and it's been worked on, but we just haven't got there yet. And so hopefully it's something that we're gonna be seeing within my lifetime because it would just make way more sense. Um, so where do you start? The big thing um, that COVID taught me is the earlier you start these discussions, the better. And it's our opportunity to be able to engage with individuals when they're healthy and they don't have any problems and being able to build that trust and to be able to really understand um, are, are the individuals we care for are the ones that are driving um, how how we take care of them. And so we need to know that early on to be able to, to be consistent with how they wanna be cared for. Um, I always ask if they've completed any documents because it gives me a starting point and I always start with the healthcare proxy. Um, and when we do the healthcare proxy, I always make sure that they have an alternate on there. So whoever they designate as their surrogate decision maker, I always make sure that there's an alternate there because um, if something were to happen to their alternate and their alternate's not available, then there needs to be somebody that they've appointed as a backup. So. This is a list of resources um, that you can start educating yourselves and the people that you're taking care of. I, I love Hard Choices for Loving People. Um, it's written by a chaplain. It doesn't give answers, but it gives you the pros and cons of all the decisions. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that and go through it. Um, it's a really, really well written document. Um, it's a and it's you can you can get it online um, off the internet and i gave you all the links for everything the five wishes document um, is a great way to start the conversation and to have people start thinking about what's important to them um, we can't tell people what's important to them only they can tell us what's important to them medical order for life sustaining treatments that's the most form and so there's a download there that you can actually download the form but it also gives you information as to what it means honoring choices massachusetts this is a wealth of knowledge and you can download a most form you can download healthcare proxy forms it answers all of the questions um if i had to tell you one site to bookmark on your computer it would be this i use this form all the time and i this site all the time um, it's evidence-based it's it's just a wonderful wonderful resource for people and the last thing is a conversation project so the conversation project um i love i just think i think the conversation project is a really nice way to get people to start talking about what's important to them. 
statistically, I, I looked at, um, I always look at kind of the data that they have on it. And they, one of the things, and, and, and I'm really sad to see this because it hasn't changed. 92% 92, 92 of Americans say that they, that it's important to have these conversations. So 92% of the people that they polled say that it's really important to talk to somebody about what their goals um, and how they wanna be taken care of and what's important to them. The saddest thing about this is only 32% of the people report ever having actually had these conversations. So I'm going to go back to my second slide that talked about 88% of the nurse practitioners are practicing in primary care. And so I look at that as our challenge um, to be able to do better and to be able to push the needle and to start having these conversations and getting that number up because people want to talk about it. We just, as, as nurse practitioners, we need to give them that opportunity. So Lori put this up too. So this is just what um, a healthcare proxy form looks like in Massachusetts. And I actually downloaded it from Honoring Choices. This is the MOLST. So what the MOLST stands for is Medical Order for Life Sustaining Treatments. And it's a discussion that you have between the individual that you care for and their and their either their physician, their nurse practitioner, or their physician assistant. And what we talk about is um, resuscitation. And we're going to talk more about this in a couple of slides, ventilation, if they want to be transferred to the hospital. And then the other life-sustaining treatments that we talk about is artificial hydration and artificial nutrition. So that's a feeding tube and IV and dialysis. So this is what the most form looks like. And, and the most form goes on hot pink paper. And so what the hot pink paper does is it draws attention to anybody that comes in um, to the room, whether it's EMTs, it's providers, um, if the person has um, naturally passed or if they're having a problem, what I always say to people is um, this is their voice. When they don't have a voice or if they don't have a voice at a certain time, this form is their voice because they've completed what they want. Um, and so this is for people to look at and to refer to. So this is Hard Choices for Loving People. And so this is the book um, that was written by Hank Dunn. And so the different chapters and the things that he addresses is, shall resuscitation be attempted? He doesn't tell you, should you do it or shouldn't you do it? He tells you what happens on both sides. Shall artificial hydration and nutrition be utilized? So should they have a feeding tube or should they have IVs? Should a nursing home resident or someone at home be hospitalized? Is it time to shift the treatment goal from cure to hospice or comfort care only? What outcomes can we reasonably expect from medical treatment given the current medical condition of the individual? So components of advanced directive. So remember the advanced directive is the document. And so these are so this slide has old, as I'm looking at this, this has old stats from the conversation project. Um, so the old stats said 82% of the people wanted to have something in writing, but only 23% did. Um, the new stats are saying 92 and only 23. So we really haven't, um, we haven't really done a great job at being able to push the needle on this one. So the components that we think about are do not resuscitate or no CPR, do not intubate or no ventilators. And just, I'm gonna digress for a second about the ventilators and COVID. Um, the media did such, uh, a, they just did so much damage um, to individuals that were, that were thinking about how they wanted to complete their advanced directives or struggling um, with keep with with staying alive, quite honestly, because of the pandemic, because they made it sound like anybody could like walk into CVS and just get a ventilator. Um, and what the reality was is that we didn't have enough. And so they were rationing healthcare services. And it was a, it was a really kind of low point in the, there was a lot of low points in the COVID pandemic. But for me, it was really hard because I had a lot of people calling me wanting to reverse their um, 
do not intubate part of their advanced directive because they just thought that they could get a ventilator and everything was going to be fine. So, you know, it just, it was a hard time. Um, the next thing is feeding tubes. So that's artificial nutrition, artificial hydration are your IVs. Um, medications is another thing we think about. And when is it time to routine, to withdraw the routine medications and start comfort measures and pain management? And is there a time when we think about that we don't go to the hospital anymore? Okay. Okay. So the first thing that we think about is do not resuscitate and that's CPR. And I always say to people, CPR and, and mechanical ventilation or intubation go together. And so how successful are, eff are efforts to restart a heart? Are there any complications? Can we know ahead of time which patients are most likely to be revived by resuscitation efforts? And how do patients let their wishes be known if they choose not to have resuscita um, resuscitation efforts? So when I talk to my patients about this and, and the individuals that I care for, this starts really early on and we start having these conversations because they're hard conversations to have. But what I've learned is that it's hard to have the conversation. Sometimes I get uncomfortable because I feel uncomfortable having to bring up these difficult topics. But overall, what I've learned is that they want to talk about it and they're happy to, to kind of engage. And if you look at the resources that I gave you, you're able to answer these things. Like it's, it's a, it depends on the person, um, start the education early and, and let them know and be honest because people can't make decisions and they can't make, because we talk about informed consent, they can't have informed consent if they're not given the appropriate information. So they need to know that there's a possibility that ribs are going to be broken, that they can pierce the lungs, they can pierce the liver, that depending on where they are and what resources available, whether their resuscitation is going to be um, successful is questionable. And if somebody goes on a, a event, are you going to be able to get them off or is the family going to have to make the decision to withdraw it? These are decisions that evolve over time. And so in the beginning, people might not be ready to make the decision, but they're ready to have the information, the education that you're giving them. So you always start with the information. And when I, when I have these conversations with people, um, again, we talk about person-centered. I don't go in saying we need to fill out the form. I go in saying, can we have a conversation? I've got some really important things that we need to talk about. So artificial nutrition, artificial hydration, so feeding tubes and IVs. So things that Hard Choices for Loving People talks about are, what are some of the benefits of artificial feeding tubes? What are some of the complications of artificial feeding tubes? So. Um, benefits of artificial feeding tubes are if they're short term, if somebody's got a short term problem, it's a great way to keep somebody nutritionally um, supported. If you've got somebody like with advanced Alzheimer's disease that we know that weight loss and feeding problems is a normal progression of their disease, then a feeding tube could actually cause them, they, they can still aspirate with a feeding tube. Um, they can pull the feeding tube out. Like there's a lot of complications that people just need to know both sides. What are some of the advantages of dying without the use of artificial feeding or IVs? And a lot of times people are gonna say, so she's just gonna starve to death you're just going to let her just be dehydrated and there's, then she's going to be comfortable. How are you going to give medications if you don't have a feeding tube? And so these are all really important things because basically if they're not going to do it, we're just changing the goals of care. We're not taking things away. We're going to focus more on comfort. And so if they choose not to have a feeding tube or IVs, we've got medications that can go under their tongue. We've got gels that we can rub into their skin we still have opportunities to be able to treat people and to make them comfortable without using this. But again, you start the conversation early and find out what's important to them. 
cure sometimes comfort always when's the right time to prepare for dying and so one of the things that i always ask people is you know would you like to die naturally and I've yet to have somebody say no, that they wouldn't like to die naturally. And so I, I talked to them about like, what does that mean to you? You know, what does that mean to you? Um, and even if they're not actively dying, I bring up hospice early because people hear, and I always say they hear the H word and they get really scared because they think that, oh my gosh, is she dying right now? And that's not the case people can hear information better if you're talking to them when they're not in a crisis situation. And I say that, I'll, I'll share that. I'm like, you know what, things are going really well right now. So now's the time to, to talk about, you know, what decisions you might need to make in the future and what resources are going to be available to you to support you. Um, hospice, hospice is covered um, either by the par day benefit of their Medicare, or if they've got private insurance, some of the private insurances cover hospice, depending on what the person's age is. And, you know, I talk to people about that and I talk about, you know, what can hospice do to support you on your journey, um, making sure that we maintain your dignity and your comfort. One of the things that they want to know is how can we assure that they're, that they'll be having a peaceful death and we can't, how do I put this? We, that's one thing that we have control over because we've got medications that we can use. And I go over like when we use the medications, how we use them, because the medications can be scary as well. Um, but there's also a team of people that come with hospice. There's chaplains, there's social workers, there's volunteers, there's nurses, there's the people that are still wherever they are living, if they're at home or they're in an assisted living or in a nursing home or a memory care unit. Everybody works together um, to be able to promote a death that's consistent with their goals and values. So do not hospitalize. Um, what are some of the issues one needs to consider when thinking about hospitalization, ventilator support, dialysis, or the use of antibiotics? And I always say to people, if you don't want things done, then you need to think about why you're going to the hospital. What do you hope to accomplish by going to the hospital? Um, and, and we discuss it and it's something that happens over time. And how do you, uh, how do I communicate my treatment wishes to the medical team caring for me? And that's where completing the advanced directive document comes into play. And I talk to people about that. That is their voice and that's how they maintain control so that things don't happen to them or things do happen to them that they choose. What are some questions that need to be answered to help me make a decision about life prolonging procedures? And and I put that out to people and I always, I always say when I'm having these conversations, and I teach my students this as well, if you're doing all the talking, then there's a problem. So you need to be listening more than you're talking because you need to give the information to the person that you're meeting with and then give them a chance to just kind of think about it and ask you questions. So what options are available to support individuals and their caregivers as medical conditions worsen and this is what they want to know as we're as we're changing the goals of care and as people are nearing the the end of their life they want to know that there's still things that we're going to be able to do so we may not be sending them to the hospital we may not be using ivs or feeding tubes but there are still things that we can do to keep them comfortable, to maintain their dignity. Palliative care is the first thing. So I'm working in palliative care now, and we work on symptom management for people that have chronic or life-limiting illnesses. But what I explain to people, because people will always say to me, well, what's the difference between palliative care and hospice? And I always say, I'm a one-man show. So when I come in to see you, I come in and I work with you and all the team um, to figure out how do we manage your symptoms, whether they're physical, they're emotional, they're spiritual. Hospice, on the other hand, brings a team with them. 
And so they do what I do, but they have more capacity and they can bring resources to be able to support the person in whatever their journey is moving forward. And so I, by introducing these terms early on, hopefully by the time that they're actually appropriate for hospice, it's not as scary to them and they see that there's a lot of value and that we're not only focusing on dying, but we're focusing on how do we help them to live whatever life they have um, consistent with who they are as a person. So this is from the World Health Organization and palliative care is about helping people maintain quality of life through practical help, physical care, medicines, spiritual and emotional support. And for, for all of the students out there, um, you don't have to work for a palliative care program to do palliative care. Palliative care is done everywhere that we go. And as nurse practitioners, we're all providing palliative care for our patients. And so the last thing is hospice. So hospice is a philosophy of care for individuals with life limiting medical conditions. And it focuses on, um, it focuses on um, the Medicare coverage or private insurance, and we already talked about that, um, that the care is delivered wherever the individual lives. And that's really big for people because they want to stay put. And whether they're aging in place and they're able to stay in their own home or they're in an assisted living or they're in a SNF. I have somebody that's in a SNF that I just went to do a palliative care consult and he loves his SNF. And he said to me, I get to stay here. I don't have to leave. Right. And I said, no, you get to stay here. He said, cause this is my home now. And I said, yes, it is. And we need to finish this journey in your home. So it's really reassuring for them to know that they don't have to leave. There are hospice houses um, that are available for people that need a hospice house and the hospice um, agency that the person is with will help them to navigate that if they do need to go to an actual hospice house. The hospice houses are places where people actually um, have very limited time. So it's not something that people would go to stay for months. It's usually weeks that people are there. Um, hospice focuses on the symptom, the physical symptom management, emotional support for the individual, but it also supports whoever their their support system and caregivers are. They provide beautiful spiritual support um, for everybody that's involved, the patient and their support system. But the other piece, and I share this with my my patients when I talk to them that are on hospice, they also take care of the fan, the family or whoever their support system is after the person dies. They have a whole bereavement care program that takes care of um, the support network to make sure that, that they're okay on the next part of their journey. So... Our job is not to make up anybody's mind, but to open minds and to make the agony of decision making less intense. So my friends, the nurses and the nurse practitioners students, we are nurses. And the one thing that just fills my heart is knowing that we are the most trusted profession. And that is an honor and it's a privilege that we have. And being able to promote quality of life for our patients um, that are in long-term care or that are starting their journey towards long-term care is something that we need to take really seriously. And your challenge as you go out to practice is to make an impact and to have these conversations and to educate yourself so that you're able to really engage um, and be there for your patients and to meet them where they're at and provide the care that they want you to provide, not the care that you want them to provide, that you want to provide for them. It's, it's, it's a collaboration. And so figure out what your patients want and meet them there. So be kind, be brave, be honest, be creative, be humble, be thankful, be happy, be you. As you go out into practice, you're just, I love what I do. I feel like I have called, uh, have a calling and this service that I get to do as a, as a geriatric nurse practitioner, I, I think is an honor and a privilege. And, you know, I, I applaud all of you. So. I'm done.
Thanks, Pen. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kelly. That was awesome. Um, I think it's such an important part of long-term care. And as you pointed out, is often, you know, um, avoided if, if possible until it becomes a critical issue. And it's very clear that you're passionate about what you do. Um, so that's really, really good. Um, Jake, I think I, I really, I'm tying this together now. Um, because you're supposed to be talking about the financial issues. And well, we really have covered, you know, uh, to me, when, when you hear both Lori and Kelly speaking, I mean, you hear what the realities are, but you also hear the, the practicality and the importance of everything that they've talked about and things that need to be done, et cetera. And I think, Jake, it's important for you to give us that financial picture um that exists out there and so that we can kind of tie it all together and come up with a summary at the end i'll tell you i'll say something that i don't know if i should have went last being all we're talking about person-centered care and all the great things and i'm talking about how do we pay for it it's not the best to be at the end but i'll try to avoid my term that Lori's heard we can't afford it right i'm sure you all heard that when you ask for things but I can hope to kind of give you a little bit more light on what that looks like from a financial lens. So I'm going to share my screen and hopefully pull up your PowerPoint Perfect. at the slide that I wanted it. Let's see. All right. And now I'll go to slideshow up here and from the current slide. And there we are. All right. I think the idea was just to give a little bit of background on the, a lot of the different um, you know, options. We talked a lot about the different types, independent living, skilled nursing, assisted living and such. And then we also, talk, obviously, Lori talked about the challenges in operating a community and Kelly um, and providing those um, essential services to our folks living in those communities. And so I just want to spend a little time giving a little bit of background on what the differences are. Um, I think there's some great questions populating as well. So I'll kind of breeze through this, but uh, I think we'll talk some of it in some of your questions as well. But I think there's a big question around nonprofit and for-profit. Um, I think this is a challenge where, you know, we're, we have a mission in providing care. Um, we also have a financial margin that we usually have to achieve and that helps us to provide quality care. Um, I think both nonprofit and for-profit um, communities alike experience that same component. Uh, we have to have cash flow to make our pay, payroll and pay the for the food cost. Um, having all the great teams and caring for folks. Certainly, you know, Lori mentioned when you find good associates, you need to hold on to them, and that really comes from a financial um, incentives as well. They're looking for financial growth in their careers as well. So um, I think there are nonprofit and for profit organizations. Um, it doesn't mean that a nonprofit is just a standalone all by itself community. It can be. Um, and then there's certainly for profit where it gets a little bit, I think, in the weeds and it won't go too far unless someone has a question about it more specifically. But um, the Commons is a unique example. Um, the Commons and Lincoln was owned um, as a for profit from the ownership side and then was managed by a management company that was for all essential tax purposes was considered for profit. Recently, the community was purchased by a nonprofit New England life plan community group. So they have that nonprofit status from an ownership standpoint, but then there's the operations of who's managing the day to day. Um, so for profit doesn't always mean that we're funneling money into um, CEOs with private jets. It just means what the mission is. And there's certainly a tax um, component attached to the organization. We Some of the questions talk around private pay, Medicare, Medicaid, um, and I think some of the misconceptions. I've heard a lot too, if when you ask someone maybe in their 70s or 80s who thought they were going to live at home the majority of their life, and then now they need to go into a more supportive environment, there's an automatic assumption, well, I have Medicare. Um, and I think you know, no, not knowing the full audience we have, but Medicare is just like insurance. It's really for that short-term cause, Medicare Part, part A. 
Um, it's really more for the acute stuff and the preventative things. Medicaid is providing services for an income eligibility or disability rating. Um, Medicaid um, options, you certainly have to have assets and annual income under a certain thresh threshold. And then the state essentially is controlling those dollars. There's a bucket of money given to every state um, from our you know, taxes and such. And there's mandatory things the state has to cover under the Medicare, Medicaid, excuse me, um, offerings. And then there's selective things. So that will vary by state. Medicare is certainly the federal money that CMS collects. It's interesting hearing Lori describing how highly regulated skilled nursing. If you think about Medicare in general from a federal government, it's a third of the federal budget is spent on um, Medicare right, and related cost. So the only other two industries that are highly regulated as to long-term care and hospitals would be prisons and nuclear power plants. Um, I think it's a fun little, fun, fun little fact, but then private pay is um, a lot of what's happening now is there's a lot more private pay options out there. Um, and certainly we can talk as we go through some of the questions around how long-term care insurance and such impacts that as well. Public versus private. Um, this is just reference to there are different ownership and companies out there. There's large chain providers um, and all different levels of care. Some of them are publicly traded on the stock market. Others um, are private. Um, some are standalone. One community might be owned by one individual or one organization may only own one senior living community, skilled nursing, et cetera. Others are owned by large chains. Um, one of the first large, you know, national chain was Sunrise Senior Living was started. Um, it was uh, across all, all states. They then were, went public, um, so publicly traded, had shareholders, and then um, in 2008, during the housing market, they went from a private, uh, they went back private from, from the um, public eye. You know, a lot of the funding for private pay, if you think about as we age, our biggest asset um, beyond retirement savings, but even including, you know, retirement pensions incomes is really in our home values, typically for most most folks that are fortunate that are, you know, those that are fortunate to be able to have a home um, that they own. And so that really is what funnels a lot of the private pay options out there, like what Lori's described with the CCRCs. The idea is you sell your large asset, your home, and then you take that money and you park it into a CCRC community, and then you're able to draw off those funds to kind of help private pay your way. Um, that's not an option for everyone, as we as we know. I think one of the biggest challenges we have in our industry is affordable housing options. Um, some of the questions just touching on asked, you know, what are the, so we have Medicare that's going to pay for a short-term rehab stay. It's going to pay for your hospital stay, of course. If you need therapy and rehab, it's going to pay um, when you need services like in a skilled nursing environment. Very limited time, usually only for a few weeks at the most. Um, and then it's really the person either goes home or what's the other options. And I think, unfortunately, our state, from a public policy standpoint, our state-funded options for seniors right now is lacking um, behind and that you know rising demand of the seniors who need it who are living with chronic illness who need that supportive environment from a housing perspective are falling through the cracks there um capital you might hear me re reference this at times capital is just a fancy word for cash and money right and why is it important um it's what really funnels an organization like a skilled nursing environment it's what um, you need the capital, you need the cash to make your pay payroll. You certainly also need it for building improvements. And um, unfortunately, in Massachusetts, in the last few years, I think COVID really hurt this in our industry the hardest from a skilled nursing stand standpoint. Is that you know most of our skilled nursing communities, as folks have shared on this panel, that they really didn't. They were kind of the main only source for a lot of our seniors. As they as they aged, a lot of our skilled nursing communities were built 60s, 70s, 80s, and then now we're moving into a time where they're 20 to 30 years old. That means an elevator is 30 years old, pipes, plumbing, electrical. 
Um, unfortunately, what happens at times is a community, a long-standing skilled nursing community in the community has always been that provider of choice for a lot of folks. And then what happens is their elevator breaks and the elevator repairs are one and a half million dollars. They just don't have that cash reserve. And so unfortunately at times they're forced that they have to close. And that's usually what's driving a lot of our closures in especially skilled nursing right now is the amount of capital needs because of the age of the community and the systems and it just costs more to operate these communities now. Um, and the biggest, I think, cost to health, health healthcare in running a community, 80% of our expenses are related to labor. Um, our second highest cost, which is only around eight to 9% is food, raw food. The other, other components, technology, um, benefits and those kinds of things, but labor is our most costly item. And so we get into things like, you know, mandatory staffing, which that's been in the news a lot recently, especially after COVID, uh, we should mandate the nurse or CNA to resident or patient. And, you know, regulatory wise, we want to mandate that because in theory, that will equate to better quality outcomes and better care. But what it does is puts a lot of pressure onto the operator where 80% of that extra cost come, comes in. And a lot of them are very fearful that they won't be able to make their payroll. And that's what usually causes closures as well. Or the community is finding cost cutting measures otherwise, right? We won't be able to repaint the walls or replace our furniture in the living room because we have to repair the roof instead. And so those types of challenges that are really impacting our industry right now. Unfortunately, a lot of the new products out there, the new assisted living communities, the new um, independent living and such, the new active adult 55 plus, those are all typically private pay. Um, the government funded options are limited, right? And so as an operator, it may cost you, I think Lori mentioned this a little bit, that state Medicaid rate, let's say just to make numbers easy, they may pay you or Lori, let's just say $150 a day to take care of that person. That's the state Medicaid rate. But in reality, when you combine labor and food and Lori keeping all of her nurses happy, it might cost us on average $600 a day to care for that person. So then what we're left with is this facility, um, privately owned nonprofit has to make up a $450 Delta. Um, and how do we do that? Well, we have to, what they often call Q-mix in the skilled world is, how do we have a different variance of payer sources? So where the state's only paying us 150, we have that $450 Delta to make up then we have to charge a private pay resident who doesn't qualify perhaps for Medi Medicaid and can privately pay their funds. We have to charge them $600 to $700 a day. And that's how we try to make up our gap. Or we bring in more of the short-term Medicare residents that are the CMS and Medicare will pay a higher rate. And we're trying to find efficiencies that we can spread out the cost for those folks that we may not be able to take um, because of the state lower payment. What often happens is you might have, um, you know, a nursing home that has 20 beds available, but they won't, they've hit their capacity on how many they can accept who are on a Medicaid payer source. And that's ethically that hurts to think about, right? We have a, someone in need who needs our services, but as the operator in the financial side, if I take this person and it's $600 a day, Again, that's a $450 Delta that I had to figure out how do I make up? Um, and that's why we are so fortunate to have folks like Lori to try to figure that out for us. The bricks and sticks versus home um, health and community-based services. You know, a lot of the options um, revolve around living in a congregate housing environment where some folks could live in a community cheaper um, and how could that work? And I'll give it kind of a give an example. Let's say you have an 85 year old gentleman living at home and his biggest thing is he can't um, prepare his own meals. He may not be able to stand for long periods of time, but he needs a lot of nutritious meals. Um, 
certainly just for his quality of life and well-being. And maybe he needs assistance, some medication reminders in the morning, and he might need some help with his TED host st stocking. Well, him living in that skilled nursing is the only place where he typically, not the only, but the majority of the, his only options, and he financially isn't able to private pay anywhere else. His really only option is to move into a skilled nursing environment. And obviously the cost to care for this person would be extremely high, but his care needs are extremely low. And so is that skilled nursing, that expensive option with all those mandatory nursing hours we have, is that the best place? So a lot of states are getting creative with their Medicaid dollars and they're either, what I like to use for lack of a better term, pri privatizing options, and I'll explain some of that, or can we put more money into community and home-based services? Can we implore more folks to go into people's homes where they live now and provide some TED hose support, medication reminders? Can we supplement technology systems? Like the, I'm, I'm a veteran and get my VA services that now have devices for veterans where you can have a med box that'll send a signal from the you know, from the technology source, reminding a veteran to take his medications. That may work. We can keep this person at home where they probably enjoy living at, but also it's a less expensive cost and a burden on the state. The other option is, you know, do we just bring in more services? Do we increase our home health dollars? Um, can we send a nurse instead of once a week? Can we send a nursing aide seven days a week to help this person in the mornings? What, um, when I say privatize, is there's companies out there now that are saying, well, if the state's going to give me $150 a day to a skilled nursing environment um, for because this person qualifies for Medicaid, well, here, I'm going to start a company that's going to be a home-based kind of congregate housing option where we're going to send people into the homes um, to help, help those. We're also going to provide transportation, and we're going to bring them to kind of our community center. If anyone in Massachusetts is familiar with an organization called Harbor Health, they're doing that. So they're taking bundled payments from the state, is saying, we're going to give you a bundled pay payment, and you have to meet this person's needs in totality. And we think you, as a healthcare operator, probably understand this a little bit better than us as the state running an operation like, like, like this. So they're leaning on these folks who might be able to do it more efficiently, might have the organizational kind of apparatus and infrastructure to provide those services as well. And so I think we're seeing a shift into a lot more community-based home and services. A, I think, because as I mentioned earlier, that's where the majority of people um, aging want to age in place into their actual homes. Um, and B, it's less it's just quite honestly less costly than sending them to an assisted living community. Um, great. Penny, the last slide I think I have here. I'm going to, um, this is very similar. Lori touched base on the managed care kind of ACO component. And I always like to describe an ACO, like if, when we talk about our insurance, if you're a Blue Cross and Blue Shield, you have either um, a managed care option um, or you can go outside of a network, of typically a PPO option. And an ACO is very similar. It's a group, as Lori described, that they contracted with different folks within the continuum of care. Um, that saying, hey, if we can do better and we can all work together, be more efficient, reduce the cost, then we'll get a little financial reward because we're helping with the cost savings. And it's a kill two birds with one stone because we should be providing better healthcare out outcomes. Where it's a challenge, much like your, if you think about your own insurance, when you go out of net network and you're getting services out of that group, that's where they can't control the cost as much and we lose control of providing the quality of care. Um, these are certainly evolving in a lot of different forms. The barrier we have is they typically involve the physician group, um, the hospital, um, home health under the Medicare Part, Part A, and they, provide, and they include skilled nursing. But if a resident lives in an assisted living private pay or chooses to live at home, Sometimes that's where those gaps fall. 
And um, as Lori described, there's a lot of pressure to have quality outcomes, but also shorten our length of stay, shorten that expense load and send them home sooner. Um, and that's where I think we're seeing a lot of this of just how can we manage all these chronic illnesses and meet a person's needs, but how can we financially afford it and make it possible? Because as we all know, again, in another six years, one in five um, US citizens will be over the age of 65. So we have a lot of care and expenses coming from um, the federal government. I, I'm sorry, I have one more. So these are some of just the ethical dilemmas that I talk about, um, especially if there's any students on who wanna take HP 626 with Regis, we talk about this a lot. Um, ethical dilemmas, mandatory staffing. Again, we talked about there are a lot of benefits and sometimes we probably need our regulators to hold operators. We are not fortunate to have a sea of the lorries in, in the world managing these communities. So we sometimes need the regulatory body to hold folks accountable as they're providing care to folks and they're not short staffing and they're not putting residents at risk only to maximize revenue and profits. Um, however, that has a huge financial burden on communities and there is only a certain pot of money. Um, and so if you know we are going to mandate staffing, we need to really also look at how do we increase funding and support um, reimbursements for those communities trying to provide care. Medicaid spend down, this has um, been going on for quite some time. There's obviously a lot of legal loopholes now where someone has assets, they can, the idea is that you would be able to private pay for your care if you need it in a long-term care setting, assisted living, et cetera. You'd be obligated if you have the money, you should pay, pay for it. The you met Medicaid, the state would start paying once you hit a certain financial um, level. So Medicaid spend down is some folks will take their assets and put them into an irrevocable trust, essentially take the assets out of their name, or they'll gift things like a home, car, find money to adult children. So that way, in the eyes of Medicaid, they look like they don't they would qualify now financially. And again. Ethical dilemma, certainly this person's paying into a system from their taxes. It's a benefit they've been promised, but also it does put a burden on to the healthcare providers uh, when folks are relying solely on that Medicaid funding. And so there's that private pay piece that might be needed to offset some of the expenses. So at what level do we allow that to happen? Who should pay? Is it the responsibility to care for our seniors? Um, and folks aging in place, is that, a, is that a burden that falls on the state? Is there a personal um, requirement for that? Um, again, who should pay is often the question. Um, there's obviously, I think there's been a shift in sometimes palliative and hospice funding for Medicare. For all those nurses or NPs or those folks working in communities, you used to get Medicare to pay for a hospital bed or durable medical equipment if someone needed it. Um, that's much tougher now to do. Um, certainly, I think hospice has become a way where there's a lot more funding now that's saying, unfortunately, I think it's a business decision at times too. We're going to put more funding into hospice. I know there's a lot of positive um, reasons why palliative care and hospice exist in that to have, but there's also a business decision. It'll cost us less if this is an option and we can provide resources for a limited amount of time than providing Medicare payments for costly treatments and um, medical procedures over someone's life as well. And then again, I know I'm following up with all the great things we were talking about with just the financial realities of it. And then community-based care versus affordable housing. We certainly have an affordable housing crisis, I feel, of aging seniors and what are the options out there? Um, where do they go? And um, you know, a 97 year old who's completely independent, but just needs help with the medication reminders and meals, doesn't have a lot of options if they can't afford a private pay option. So with that, I don't know if we wanna jump over to our Q&A piece. Yeah, I, let me close this down if I can. I, usually you can just go to end show and that takes care of that. 
Well, I thought it did. But anyway, I'll stop sharing my screen. That'll help. Okay, so I stopped sharing my screen. That's much better. We have time for a few questions. And then I do have um, some summary points that I tried to pull away from the from the conversation. Um, do we have questions in the chat, Tyler, or or uh, anybody see questions that we could answer? I can. I'm um, happy to look at, I think um, Diane mentioned that the CMS does allow consumers some visibility around qual quality with the five five star um, component. I'd be curious from Lori, from your perspective, is that always a true indicator from a quality perspective? I think it's an indicator. I don't always think that it is a complete picture. And it's also, although I think it's getting closer and closer to real time, it's always a little bit behind depending upon what quality measure is, is being reviewed. It could be as old as a year, year and a half old, depending upon what it is. I think the most one of it, it's an indicator. It isn't the only one. I think it's incredibly important to go in and tour and meet with leadership, um, see how see how folks look, how does the environment smell, how does it feel, how does the culture feel, you know, going through a center and really seeing it in real time, I think is important. And certainly asking the questions about staffing ratios, I think staff, staffing ratios are incredibly important. It's not the only indicator, you can have too much staff, you know, the, the snowstorm days where you only have a few staff and the team's working together and getting it done, although you don't want every day to be like a snowstorm day. Right. Um, but I think just going and touring, it's not the only indicator, but it's certainly an important one. Okay. Tyler, do you see any other questions in the chat? Yeah, there's been like questions going out throughout the whole thing. Hold on. Well, what if we pick out a couple? Okay. Um... While you guys talk, can I just say, because I've been kind of scanning them, and I just have one thing that I was going to say just as I was talking while Tyler looks to see if there's any other questions. When you're talking to individuals about resources, one of the things that I've just kind of learned is I don't promise anything until I can actually go do some research on my own to see what people are actually eligible for and how can I be creative, like Jake was saying and Lori was saying, how can we be creative to think of ways that we can best support people? Because everybody's got different circumstances and the one thing, the one problem that I see a lot in the long, as people are getting older and they're moving towards needing the different options is thinking that they're eligible for all of these different resources to support them when they aren't. And so I just caution you um, before you start promising, just do your research and figure out what they're eligible for um, and what you can help them with. And I think to Kelly's point there, the biggest qualification tends to be financial. You know, what your options can be really big if you have uh, someone with some financial resources, it shrinks. Um, certainly, there's still options out there, but it certainly shrinks down a little bit from a financial component. Yeah, and I'm going to add to that too. Oops, I muted myself. No, we can hear you. Can you hear me now? Yep. Yep. Okay, great. Thank you. So I'm, I'm going to add to that too, and I think that folks do need to look at their own insurance plans and understanding them. It used to be that it was just a Medicare mm -hmm. um, coverage and in Part B um, with a MedEx plan, and now there's a myriad just for short-term rehab services. There are so many different health plans out there that uh, I think it's important for folks to understand their own, own insurance. And we too, Kelly, don't make promises until we flush through their insurance plans and try to see what the coverage is. And even that is a huge task 
just trying to identify what's covered and what isn't in, yeah. in when. None of it is straightforward anymore. The other thing that I, I know I did scan through to see some of the questions as well. And, you know, certainly I didn't go into a lot of detail and, and I'm grateful that, that Jake um, took that piece on. But there is a there is a gap um, in being able to cover long term care services. There isn't a group adult foster program in some of the assisted livings that can be accessed. So that's one component. But also there is there's something out there where and I haven't seen it recently, um, but there's there's a program where families, I believe, can be compensated family slash friends compensated for taking care of yeah. their loved ones at home. And I don't know if that, um, I don't know the full details, but that was a program that was out there at, at one time. And then certainly the PACE programs. And I think, I think Jake had referenced this as well, that there are folks that are out there managing individuals who, who are on mass health programs and trying to keep them at a lower cost at home. However, 24-7 at home is absolutely not cheaper than a skilled nursing right. facility. I will say that 24-7 care is not less expensive. So navigating through and oftentimes because we do so much short-term rehab, we're doing a lot of setting up those services at home and trying to be creative between family members and services and home health and all of those kinds of things because people do typically want to go home. So there's a there's a lot that that you have to navigate with every single person that you're trying to place safe safely to the next level of care. Right. And just to provide a quick little number around the private pay costs. Um, on average, a skilled nursing private pay is probably anywhere from $350 to $600 a day, depending on what part of the country you are. So it's driven by the cost of labor and all the other components. Private pay assisted living can range anywhere from $4,000 up to $12 um, a month, and that's private pay. And then memory care typically ranges from eight to $20,000 a month. A lot of it's depending on the real estate, you know, living in Brookline would be very different than living out in Agawam, um, Massachusetts, but it's still the biggest cost is that labor and what it costs to care for someone. So the higher acuity, the more expensive it is because you need more staff involved in caring for someone and more skilled staff to do that. Um, so some of those numbers can be a little, I think, shocking for folks when they find out how expensive it can be. Thank so you. I just I just looked up because to follow up on what Lori was saying, there is reimbursement through Medicaid, but each state is different. So if somebody because I mean, the elephant in the room, just to be transparent, is to go to assisted livings and memory care units, you need money. And so I think that the biggest challenge that I have with the patients and right now I'm taking care of people in rural Maine that have no money and how do you get them resources to be able to support them so that they have quality of life and that they have the support and the resources that they need and, and you need to be creative. And so each state has, it, it's done through Medicaid, but each state has different regulations as to how you apply to be able to get reimbursed as a caregiver if you are taking care of a loved one at home. Um, and I have had some of my families that have done that and it's really rewarding for them. But to support what Lori said, like it's really great to say to stay home and take care of your loved one, but it's a 24 hour, seven day a week job. And so again, just to kind of bring it back to where we started, we need to take care of the caregivers also. And so if, if, they're doing that. How do we prevent caregiver burnout so that they feel supported? Um, because it's a big job. It's it's a lot of work, but there are like ways to be creative to be able to find resources. Thank you, Kelly. Um, we are at past 830 and we really do try to end on time. This has just been an incredibly thought provoking um, consciousness raising session without a doubt. I came up with like four summary points. 
but given how late it is, I I think I'll go with a couple that are probably the most important for me. One is that providers and institutions are adapting to provide services under financial constraints and legal regulations, but that success in adapting to all the variables will come through creative partnerships and innovative thinking. I mean, working together to use the resources we have and being creative about how we use them. Um, the other thing is, is that uh, we can't, uh, having heard Kelly, we can't avoid that whole issue of helping uh, individuals with life care planning and long term and um, you know, uh, their living wills, et cetera, because that is a part of long-term care and we can't just ignore that. And last but not least, I think working hard to preserve the autonomy of individuals and in, in the later years in life and that to do that, um, we need to hire, retain, maintain, um, human resources, associates that really, really uh, care about providing care and helping individuals remain uh, independent to the extent that they can. So it was an amazing um, presentation. Do any of the panelists have any one final remarks they want to make? Or did I just capture it all so beautifully, right? <laughs> I think you did extremely yeah. well, Dr. Penny. Yeah, it was. I mean, we had to be incredibly flexible and adaptable tonight, and everyone did an amazing job. And uh, right now, um, Tyler Feaster will be putting up the evaluation um, link. Uh, you can read it there. She put a message in the chat, and uh, we can thank our panelists so much for the uh, excellent presentations they really were and we we really tied them together we did good job so uh, we'll excuse our panelists now and you all can go ahead and fill out your evaluations and thank you very much thank you oh you were amazing thank you, you really were i'll be in touch <laughs>